YouTube, it's me, Joe, and I'm back with another reaction. And we are back with Extra History. I hope you all enjoyed that long special of mine on November 11th about the, about the beginning of the First World War. I know a lot of people were like, why did, I thought you were going to do Bismarck, continue doing Bismarck. Well, yes, I did, but the date was too perfect not to do about the flippin' First World War. But now we are back with Bismarck. And now we're going to see the fate of the hood. So this part always makes me feel So let's get this video started, shall we? Let's get this video started in three, two, one, and play. The HMS Hood and Prince of Wales plow toward the Bismarck and destiny. Sit. Set, this episode is sponsored by Wargaming. Lay down. Download World of Warships and use the code EXTRA1 for free goodies. Link in the description. When we left off, the British had finally located the battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen as they steamed south through the Denmark Strait. And with Admiral Tovey and the rest of the home fleet still hundreds of miles away, it was clear that the Hood, Pride of the Royal Navy, and Prince of Wales were the only ones that could possibly stop the behemoth. Yeah. But to but understand it was the only what's ship about that to happen, we need to understand the, the state of the Royal Navy in 1941, and how interwar limitations held back their naval development. For that, allow me to turn things over to Wargaming's military expert, Richard Cutland. Following World War I, a series of maritime treaties constrained naval development in the hopes of defusing an international arms race. It really did. these treaties limited the number of new ships and set limits on the size and armament of new vessels. But later agreements eliminated the possibility of building new battleships completely. As a result, in the interwar period, Britain was forced yeah. to modernize old ships instead of building new ones. For example, the HMS Hood looks strong enough to any outside observer, but the British Admiralty was well aware of its main drawback, a weak horizontal defense, yep. especially at deck 25, which was only 76 millimeters thick. Plans to strengthen the horizontal armor had been developed back in 1927, but these works were postponed due to financial problems. In the end, they never happened at all, and this made the ship vulnerable to long-range plunging fire that fell directly down on its deck. These treaties also constrained new battleships, like Prince of Wales, to quite conservative designs. Their armament consisted of two four-gun turrets and one two-gun turret, all in a 14-inch calibre that complied is... with treaty limitations. Meanwhile, Germany was quietly violating these treaties with ships like Bismarck. And so was Japan. Guns. So even though Prince of Wales was brand new, it was underpowered at launch. In addition, the brand new Prince of Wales had teething problems. Sea trials revealed that her revolutionary quadruple gun turrets were prone to break down under strain, and this problem hadn't yet been fixed when she deployed with Hood. However, Prince of Wales was more technologically advanced than the Hood, particularly since she had modern rangefinders. And crucially, both Hood and Prince of Wales were fast, and speed was what the Royal Navy needed in an interception force. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Cutland. So that's the situation. The capable but vulnerable Hood and untested Prince of Wales are about to take on the largest and most modern warships Plus you'd think that she, they, they had to the, have the advantage that it's two solid battleships against a battleship Strait. and a heavy cruiser. Our British sailors have gotten little sleep, knowing that they would intercept the Bismarck at dawn. On the Prince of Wales, <sighs> civilian contractors have worked through the night repairing its turret guns, whose hydraulic systems are acting up. Most of the Prince of Wales crew are fresh recruits, and they're nervous. But the presence of the Hood stills their jitters. Just then, a lookout on Hood sees smoke on the horizon. The Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Admiral Holland sends a ciphered message to the rest of the fleet. From Hood, enemy in sight, am engaging. But Holland's running almost parallel to the enemy, the four ships converging slowly as they head southwest. That's no good. Not only does he need to get between Bismarck and the Atlantic, but the Hood's thin deck armor will be vulnerable to plunging fire unless he gets within nine miles. By cutting a path directly toward the Germans, he'll close the distance as fast as possible and be harder to hit, but it'll also have his firepower since his rear turrets can't join the fight. Yeah, Bismarck but will now be able to use, for it. Will be able Bismarck to use all eight guns, evade. Holland turns but to an uh, interception and course will be able to use and four. orders full this speed is... ahead. At 0552 hours, Holland orders Prince of Wales to target the lead ship. But the gunnery officer on the Prince of Wales, working with more modern optics, makes a startling realization. The Hood has targeted the wrong ship. 
Bismarck and Prinz Eugen have similar silhouettes, and the Germans have defied convention by sending the lighter armored heavy cruiser first. That was he actually due to, to the fact the hood, that Bismarck's radar was knocked out, like I said last time. Fire, wreathing the vessel in dirty brown smoke. Seeing this, the desperate gunnery officer defies the Hood's order, targets the Bismarck, and fires. On both ships, the gunnery officers look at their watches, waiting. Fifty seconds later, pillars of water leap up in front of the German ships. The salvos fall short. Worse still, one of the guns in Prince of Wales' B turret malfunctions, taking that's it out the second, of the action. That's the two-gun turret. Both ships are readjusting their aim when flashes of light run up and down the German ships. A long-range artillery duel has begun. Two minutes later, a shell from Prince Eugen crashes into the Hood's upper deck, detonating an ammunition locker. It burns with pink flames, anti-aircraft shells cooking off in bunches like firecrackers. On the Hood's bridge, the crew can hear the screams of their burning shipmates coming through the voice pipes. Admiral Holland keeps calm, but then huge columns of water leap into the air ahead of the bow, and he finally realizes that he's been shooting at the wrong ship. He hastily sends the order to retarget the Bismarck and orders a turn to port in order to bring his aft turrets to bear. It will expose him side on with the enemy, but with luck, the Hood's turn will pass just inside the nine and mile mark. This is where the mistake is made. Fire. The turn comes just in time. Bismarck's Not next yet. thunders down right where Wait the Hood had been headed. With all fire concentrated on Hood, Prince of Wales has been free to get range on the Bismarck and scores at least one hit. But her intricate four-gun turrets aren't holding up to the strain, and every few salvos, another gun goes out of action. It follows Hood into the turn, facing the German ships side on. A salvo from Bismarck brackets the Hood, shells landing on either side of the vessel. The Prince of Wales's commander, Captain Leach, knows that once a ship is bracketed, the enemy has you. He sees the Bismarck's guns flash comes. in double time, and trains his binoculars on the Hood to see the result. A shell plunges down on Hood's deck, just aft of the mainmast, and disappears. Two seconds later, the middle of the Hood erupts like a Roman candle, spraying flames hundreds of feet in the air. As Leech looks on, horrified, a colossal explosion tears the ship in two, the stern rising up out of the water as the bow sails forward under its own momentum. Yellow smoke blankets the carnage. In all the smoke, the Hood's bridge crew don't know where they've been hit or how badly. Bodies begin raining down on the bridge, thumping off the roof and landing on the wings. From below, the helmsman reports through a voice pipe that the steering isn't answering. The ship begins to list, first to port, and then capsizing 45 degrees to starboard. There's no need for an evacuation order. The crew lines up single file at the port side hatch, waiting their turn to scramble out. The squadron's navigating officer stands aside, letting junior seamen go first. One crewman glances back, he sees Admiral Holland still sitting in his command chair, going down with his ship. Seconds later, the sailor steps off the hood and into the freezing water of the Denmark Strait. Above him, he sees the majestic lines of the hood, sinking in a V formation. A turret fires a last defiant salvo before it slips into the water, and then the suction pulls him under. On the Prince of Wales, Captain Leach orders an evasive maneuver to avoid colliding with Hood's rapidly sinking stern. It disappears underwater as they pass. Nothing remains of the Royal Navy's largest and most famous ship except a burning debris field. And she was completely it is now uh, one there was actually a ship second explosion. Two. I was playing later at the end. The leech has sailed right into the Hood's former position. The Germans barely have to adjust their rangefinders. But just then, a salvo from Prince of Wales straddles Bismarck. Leech nods approval. Now that Prince of Wales has the correct range, she can bang. One compartment below the bridge, the navigation officer hears a crash above him. He shouts into the voice pipe, asking if everything's all right. At first, there's no answer, and then a stream of blood dribbles out, staining his charts. Leech gets unsteadily to his feet. One of the Bismarck's shells has hit the bridge and passed through without exploding. His entire bridge crew lies dead, except for two wounded officers. For three hellish minutes, shells pound the Prince of Wales. The armor belt takes multiple hits. The boat deck catches fire. In one of the turret magazines, a shell punches through the deck and lands, still live, next to a sailor's foot. The magazine crew is Talk about the ultimate bring me Oregon's my round pants moment. Arrive, they're not waiting. They lift the shell up out of the turret and gingerly carry it across the deck amid a full-scale battle. With a sigh of relief, they pitch it over <laughs> the side. Captain Leach knows he's been outfought. 
he turns to withdraw, making smoke to cover his retreat. The Bismarck, curiously, does not follow. Keeping well out of range, Leech brings the mauled Prince of Wales around to join the cruisers shadowing Bismarck. He signals the Admiralty. Hood has blown up. One hour after the Hood's sinking, a destroyer arrives to look for survivors. The Electra. On deck, they have rafts, life belts, and blankets lined up and ready. The medical crew is prepared to treat hundreds. Instead, they pull three oil-slicked survivors out of the water. Three out of a crew of 1,418. 1022 hours, the Admiralty. Faces are grim in the this, Admiralty's yeah. war room, 200 feet below the streets of London. The shock of losing the hood is compounded by the knowledge that German battleships were now in position to prey on vital convoys. But as the news settles in, bleak horror gives way to determined rage. The phone rings. It's Prime Minister Churchill with a personal order for every able ship in the Atlantic. Sink it is direct purpose. and to the point. Admiralty cipher officers broadcast the order wide. The aircraft carrier Ark Royal receives the signal at Gibraltar and begins to unpack its torpedo bombers. Tovey's home fleet receives the message as they race to join the stricken Prince of Wales. The battleship Rodney, headed for a refit in Boston, gets the signal and slowly turns its 16-inch guns back toward Europe. The airwaves are thick with this one message. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. The, that is pure vengeance. All right, time for the history lesson. All right, yeah. Hood, the most beautiful ship in the, na in the British Navy, sunk after Bismarck's fifth shot. That was the, it, that just shows how accurate, how advanced the Bismarck is. Is that it took five salvos before they sank Hood. Five. It usually would take a ship an average of eight. Five shots. Jeez, it's insane. Now, a little bit of interesting history time. First of all, let's talk about Hood sinking. Hood was hit in the aft magazine. And she would, and the explosion was catastrophic. Both magazines in the aft part of the ship completely erupted. That's what sliced the ship in half. But then later on, and what's unfortunately not really mentioned a lot anymore is that there was a second explosion because it was so powerful. The, ex the first explosion, it rocketed through the ship, through the vents of the vessel, and into the forward magazines under the forward turrets. And as the ship began to sink again, and it's, and it's always questioned whether it was before or after the final defiant shot of her forward gun, a second explosion tore through the ship again and blew the ship into three pieces. In fact, if you'll look at, you can actually look up images of the wreck of Hood today, because they, she was found, I believe, in 2003, I think. But when she was found, she was found in three pieces. And the bow and stern, easily recognizable, very easily distinguished. However, her midsection was completely torn apart. There are parts of her scattered for miles. It's like somebody tore off the two end, the two other ends, and then just crumpled up the middle section, spread it out over, I think, at least two and a half miles. It's an incredibly large debris field. And there's so much scattered out throughout the place. They even recovered her bell, which was incredible. And as for the three survivors, it is, it, it is incredible. The main thing that caused the death of so many people is the fact that the ship sank so fast. It sank so fast and put, created a suction vortex which sucked almost the entire crew down, aside from those three men. It is, it is unbelievable how powerful this, bomb, this explosion was. It was literally described later on by historians as like a miniature nuclear bomb. It was powerful. Now, as for the battle itself, there is actually something interesting. And this one, we're going to actually talk a little bit about Bismarck's commander, Admiral Gunther Lutschens. Now, he's an interesting character, and, I'm, and I was surprised when they didn't mention him in this series, because he's a very complicated individual. To put it shortly, Lutschens was very, very... What's the right word? 
he was not a happy man. He did not like his command. He did not like what he was doing. He was, he was a complicated individual. He honestly believed that the mission was doomed. He honestly, in this era, he believed the war could not be won. He was a very, I think the word's pragmatic, or very depressed person. In fact, when, um, when Hood engaged Bismarck, it took a while. I think, I, think, I think Hood and Prince of Wales fired off two salvos before the Bismarck actually opened fire. It was because Luchens saw those two battleships and figured he was finished. He was doomed. And he just held fire. And it actually was Bismarck's captain, Captain Lind Ernst Lindemann, who famously, from one of the sur survivors of Bismarck, quoted as saying, like, Lindemann said, I will not have my ship blown out from under my ass. And so it was Lindemann, not Admiral Luchens, who ordered Bismarck to open fire. So it's a very interesting fact that, Bis that Luchens is a very complicated individual. He was loyal to the Navy, but he was very, very anti-war. He was an, he's, an, he's a strange individual, which is, all, which is weird also. Um, one of my favorite movies, period, is Sink the Bismarck. And you can actually find it on YouTube. It's, it's an old world war, it's an old movie. Look it up, it's a great film. But the, and it's pretty good, close, it's pretty good. And the fact that they use real life models and actual like footage of similar ships is really, really incredible. I reckon it's a watch for anybody. But one character, person they get wrong is Luchens in the movie. In the movie, he's declared as like a hardcore believer in the Nazis, he's a complete, complete supporter behind them. But in real life, he wasn't like that. He was very strange. In fact, the from what I've been what I've looked up about, about the guy, he was actually almost like begged to stay in the navy. It's weird. It, it it it's weird how history is like that. I don't know. I don't know the full facts. I don't know anything because it's he's not around. He wasn't around. He didn't live through the war. He it's it's crazy. It is very crazy. It's amazing how history is when you <laughs> how how little there is it sometimes. How hard it is to find stuff. But that's what makes researching fun, is finding out things you never knew before. But yeah, now Bismarck is, she has broken out into the Atlantic, the hood is sunk, and the British Navy wants payback. Though that order, sink the Bismarck, is just, is one of the most powerful orders ever given. It also sucks the fact that Bismarck has a sister. Mm-hmm. I hope that one day the extra extra credits crew actually do a run on Turpit because you want to talk about an interesting story about how to sink a ship. <laughs> look at how look how they sank the Turpits. Anyway, this was a whole lot of fun. I enjoyed this. I can't wait for the next episode because that's where the hunt really kicks in. So, until the next video, you know who I am. I know who you are. I will see you all in the next video. Come on, puppies. I'm feeling like World of Warships. Let's go. <sighs> Save the Bismarck.